Here, have a seat. Now, can you first tell us what it is you're going to do? Sure, I'm going to scrape your face for some face mites. Both of our faces. Both of your faces. If you're willing, participants, yes, both your faces. Well, wait a minute. Hang on a sec. Is this going to hurt? Yes, definitely. Face it, or maybe you don't want to face it. You may not like bugs, but they like you. Look in the mirror. What don't you see? Well, thousands of face mites eking out a cushy living in your pores. And your home? A new study says it's replete with hundreds of species of spiders, lice, beetles, gnats, and more. Now, before you break out the lava soap and the loofah, or the antimicrobial spray in the mop, consider you may be doing more harm than good. We'll explain after we get our faces scraped for mites. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, we do that by zooming in on the tiny creatures that are on and around us. Most are harmless, some are even beneficial, and some are such close evolutionary partners with humans that their DNA can reveal fascinating stories about our ancestry. But bed bugs are annoying, and Zika virus can be dangerous. So when it comes to bugs, when do we surrender, and when do we attack? We'll take a look with all our mites. Well, there's scraping by, something that I frequently find myself doing, and then there's scraping by. <laughs> <laughs> Entomologist Michelle Troutwine, she is the curator of entomology at the California Academy of Sciences, is here in studio to give us the mother of all facials. Is that right, Michelle? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, before you scrape our faces, tell us what might be so interesting on our faces. I mean, really, why, why, why scrape them? So... I think most people don't realize, but we actually have two species of mites, microscopic mites, that actually live on our faces, actually all over our bodies. But we have one species that lives a little bit more superficially, kind of at, at the surface of your hair follicles and your skin, and then another kind of short tubby mite uh, that lives deeper in your sebaceous glands. And so that one isn't, you know, at the surface level. Are you going to look at the genetic uh, constitution of these mites if you find any? Yes, yes. And, and truthfully, I won't probably find actual whole mites on your face. That actually takes a lot of time and we need a microscope and a bunch of stuff. But what I'm going to do is scrape your face and then all the gunk I get off of your face, I'm going to take back to the lab and sequence the DNA of the mites just in the gunk on your face. So it may not be the body of a mite, but it'll be maybe pieces of its exoskeleton. Mite carcasses? That's right. <laughs> uh, so believe it or not, even though these mites live on our faces, we know very, very little about them, and there's been very little molecular work done on these mites. So almost anything you want to ask about them, there's you know something new to discover and something new to learn about. And now we have mite DNA from people who, you know, are from Africa, from Asia, from, you know, South America, all over the world. So, you know, of course, human diversity is so extensive. We have a, a long way to go before we have a more comprehensive sample. But we have a, a much better sense now for how these mites vary on people all over the world. Well, let's get those mites out in the open, <laughs> get them <laughs> off our faces. I think Molly should go first. <laughs> I'm getting some mineral oil on a cotton swab here. That sounds painless. And now, can you lift up your glasses? Yeah, I'll take them off. Okay, now I'm just gonna rub this on your face. It's greasy. And this is just gonna help me get more mite gunk. And gunk is that technical term that you use in the yes. labs. <laughs> gunk is what mites like to live in <laughs> and what they like to eat, apparently, so yep. And I'm going to do it along this area that I never knew it had a name, but it's called your nasolabial fold. It starts from your nose and goes down kind of along both sides of your mouth, that crease there. Apparently in the literature we've found that that's a great place for mites to live, maybe because it's a kind of a greasy area. Mites love that. Smile lines. <laughs> yeah, right, and your smile lines. That's a better name than nasolabial fold. <laughs> okay. Now, here is the chemical spatula. So it's not too scary, right? I know, it's small. Yeah. A tiny spatula. It doesn't and look now, too sharp. Seth, don't look like you're getting out of this. You are doing this as well. I, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to see if she uses a belt sander for this. <laughs> okay, now okay, tell me I'll, how this feels. I'm going to scrape your face 
right along your smile lines. There you go. How does that feel? Yeah, it does not hurt. Okay. It, feels, it actually feels kind of nice. All right. Well, I'm going to do it a little harder then. Because I know how many mites you're getting rid of. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is a mite? So a mite... Uh, you're not going to like this, but a mite is a is a close relative of a spider or a tick. So it's got eight legs. It's an arachnid, <laughs> and it, you know, has an exoskeleton. It has a lot of kind of stubby little legs, a long tail that fits perfectly right into your hair follicle. It's actually a pretty adorable little creature if you get to know it. There's some gunk on the end of this spatula. It could be lots of things, though. It could be sweat. Yeah, you're Face right. Face lotion is on there. I'm sure there's a lot of things in there, so it's not just mites. In fact, we're, we have to use special genetic markers to pull out the mite DNA because you're right, there's a lot of other gunk inside the gunk. Does that conclude the face scraping for me? It does, but let me give you some dilute alcohol so you can wipe the oil off your face. Okay, so I'm wiping that off. All right, Seth, get over here. Oh. Oh, no. yes. <laughs> I think when you get nervous, more mites come to the surface of your face. So but that's, that's a good that's thing. Good you can get for, rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> have them all jumping out of their burrows like prairie dogs. <laughs> Do you have any idea how many mites are inhabiting the typical skin of a typical person? I mean, are we talking a hundred? Are we talking a million? When we talk about our microbiome, it's often said ten times as many bacteria, you know, inside you as you have cells in your body. Well, apparently that number's wrong, but it's still maybe twice as many or something like that. How, ma how many mites are we talking about here? Is it I think thousands would be a fair estimate, although it's just hard to imagine. You know, I, I would say definitely from hundreds to thousands. Now I have the chemical spatula. I'm going to scrape it on your face here. How does that feel? It's okay. Gunk. Wipe it up. Perfect. But now won't, won't the mite population be uneven, that it, it'll be decimated around our face lines? And yeah, do these mites migrate? I mean, do they move around? You know, we don't know, um, but I, I assume actually that they do migrate. One little bit of evidence that I have for that is I've actually sampled my ears and my nose, mm. um, because believe it or not, these mites also live in your ears. And the mites in my ears are very genetically similar to the ones on my nose. And so I feel like at some point there must be, you know, they have to move very, very slowly, but... I think there must be some movement of populations across your face. Kind of like and, and, and did, did they ever move, you know, off your face to somebody else's face, or did they take up residence with you and stay there till they're dead? Well, that's an interesting part of our study. We found here. I'll take this. You take this. Okay. An interesting part of our study. We found that mites aren't shared between strangers uh, very frequently. So you do share mites with within family. So with your partner or spouse, and you also share mites with your offspring. So it seems like for mites to transfer between people, you really need close physical contact. They're not kind of just jumping off, you know, between us right now here. What do you call a group of mites? A bevy of mites? <laughs> a gaggle, a, yeah. a gaggle of mites? Hmm, pod. <laughs> we might be able to invent that one. We should work on that. Now, stay here and let me give you stuff to get the oil off your face. All right. Should we be concerned that there are so many mites on us? Does that mean I'm not, we're not doing our job and keeping clean? No, I, that has nothing to do with keeping clean. And I think you should have no concern that you have mites on you. One of the things we've found is that these mites have a very, very ancient association with humans and probably originated with our species, if not before. And so what that means is that we've been living and evolving with these mites for all of our history. So they're a very natural part of your skin ecosystem. How often do you change your pillowcase? <laughs> I'm just sort of curious. I think just give up on it now. I'm not, give up. No, exactly. Why exactly. bother washing anything? Okay, so, Michelle, you're going to take those mite scrapings from Seth and from me to the lab and do genetic tests on them. And what might it reveal about us? So what I'm interested in understanding more about right now is, is how these mites have evolved on humans over long periods of time. And what our studies have shown so far is that, you know, again, that these mites have been associated with us since we originated in Africa. And as we dispersed around the world and kind of split off into separate populations and different populations of humans evolved, these mites evolved with us. And so what that means is that people from different parts of the world have different lineages of mites. And so what I'm going to be looking at is how much genetic diversity is there in people from, you know, of European ancestry versus people of African ancestry versus people of Asian ancestry, and so on and so on. And, um, and then try to understand more about when these lineages split from each other and what are the genetic differences between these lineages and how is it and why is it that different skin types support different mite populations. So would it actually, by tracing back the lineage of mites, is it able to reveal something even surprising about human lineages and where they split? So you can use them as a tracer for what what humans have been doing. Right. And that's what is so incredible. And right now, all of that is kind of potential. What I've done so far really just shows that these mites do reflect human evolution. So they're not just these 
kind of bugs in our faces, right? They're these incredible storytellers that can potentially reveal more about our history than we could get from our own genetics or from fossils and so on. And they're kind of durable, too, in the sense that maybe you get a different set of mites if you look at people in Asia, for example, than here in North America. Mm -hmm. But if I go and live in Asia for five years and come back, I, I won't have Asian mites. I'll, I'll still have whatever mites I had before I went. I think so, unless... You know, if you married an Asian woman there, you know, you might be able to host some Asian mites. But one of the most interesting things that I've found that I can't really figure out right now is that we find this one global lineage of, of mites that exists on people from all over the world. But it also is the only lineage that really exists on Europeans. So we find these African and Asian lineages that can exist on people from Africa and Asia and from South America, because those people in South America are often this genetic mix of Africans and Asians. But Europeans, for whatever reason, can't host these African and Asian mites. So, yeah, if you moved to Asia, I would expect that you probably wouldn't. And do the mites stay loyal for a long time? So you have African mites, <clears throat> but then if you have African Americans who have lived here for many, many generations, do they still have African mites or do they have African American mites? Or <laughs> So that was, to me, the most fascinating part of the study that we just finished is that we found that African Americans who, again, have been living here for generations still host African mites. So it really seems like our mite populations are very stable. Very They're, mighty. <laughs> very mighty. They're vertically transmitted, meaning they go from, you know, parent to offspring. And yeah, there's not a lot of sharing. And there's potentially this skin types constrain the type of mite lineage that you might host. Well, then is it possible you might find... I Supposedly, I have some Irish lineage, but I think it goes back a long ways. Might you find a Irish mite on me? So, so far, we've <laughs> found that this European mite lineage is um, found on people, again, from all over the world. It's also rapidly expanding. And so I think that might reflect European colonization, the fact that over the past several hundred years, Europeans are moving all over the world, and perhaps their mites are too. Now, almost everyone that we've sampled has been in the United States. I think if I went to Europe and really found sampled small populations of people who had been in the same places for many, many, many generations, I think we might be able to differentiate between, you know, your Irish mites and, and some, you know, Eastern European mites. But so far, we haven't had that kind of depth of sampling yet. So rather than the fighting Irish, it might be the mighting Irish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, mighty. Can you say something more about the evolution of these mites with humans? The emergence of humans has been a very long process over millions of years, if we look at our primate ancestors. Did the mites evolve with us? And I guess I'm, I want a picture of those early mite years. At some point, these bugs got on to either humans or proto-humans. Mm -hmm. And then did they change along with us? Well, what I'd expect is that these mites originated with early mammals. And so then as mammals speciated, these mites simply speciated with mammals. And so my guess would be that we inherited our mites from our primate ancestors. And then as each kind of homo species or hominin species emerged, they had a distinct lineage of mites on them. Now, one of the amazing things that gets me really interested in doing more of this research is that the lice studies have shown that the divergences of lice lineages are so ancient that probably they reflect the divergence not of human pop modern human populations, but of other homo species. But we don't all have lice on our heads. Exactly, but we do all have mites, which means these mites could tell the story in even more uh, finely scaled manner. Do they have scales? <laughs> no, but they do have these wonderful little rings around their tails that are <laughs> very decorative. Michelle, thank you so much for coming into our studio. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Now, is that a biohazard that you're actually taking out of the studio? Do you need it? Does it need any Yes, protection? yes, we need some government uh, escorts to get us out <laughs> back to the lab. <laughs> Michelle Troutwein is the Curator of Entomology at the California Academy of Sciences. Well, Seth, you ready to have your mites put under the microscope? The mite rose, the mite Mi microscope. Microscope. <laughs> yes, yes I, I, I want to see them up close. I mean, they see me up close all the time, right down there in the pores of my nose. Well, it's interesting what Michelle said. You really can't get rid of these guys because they'll recolonize, if that's the right word. They're all over your body. And, and apparently, I mean, every mammal has them, so I guess they're not doing any damage. Might be doing some good, and I got to say, they don't make a lot of noise at night, so they don't keep me up that way. So, <laughs> so it's best that we just 
make peace with these mites, I think. Make peace with your mites. <laughs> well, Michelle Troutline says these face mite DNA results will be coming back from the lab in a couple of weeks, and it'll tell us maybe our ancestry. We'll post the results on our website if they're not too embarrassing. But meanwhile, while tiny critters like mites like you, they also like your home. Next, a new study that says that a cornucopia of tiny critters share your postal code and your kitchen counter and your living room rug. But don't panic, it's okay, unless we're talking bed bugs. You might not have any reaction initially, but then after they bite you more and more, you begin to start developing a reaction to their bites and you'll end up with having small red dots and so this is a good indicator that bed bugs are there. Also coming up, the sequencing of the bed bug genome has us asking, to which creepy crawlers do we surrender and against which do we mount an attack? We'll explain with all our mites next on Big Picture Science. Okay, so there are mites everywhere on you, and you might as well get used to it. No amount of vigorous body scraping is going to rid you of all these eight-legged hitchhikers. Besides, they might be beneficial to our health, or they may at least help out paleontologists with some clues about ancient human lineages. So just think of yourself as being made of the mite stuff. Relax, lie down on the couch among the tiny beetles and spiders who live there. Yes, your couch, your carpet, your entire house is also replete with arthropods, those animals with hard external skeletons and jointed legs. We heard from entomologist Michelle Troutwine about face mites, but she has also joined with other scientists to create the first census of the myriad tiny bugs that live in our homes. It's not just that we have this incredible diversity of bugs on our bodies. We actually are living and evolving with arthropods in our houses as well. And so in North Carolina, I led a study to explore the diversity of arthropods that live in human houses, which, believe it or not, had, had not been done before. We know a lot about the pest species that live in houses, but not a lot about all the other types of creepy crawlies that, that we're all living with. And entomologist Matt Bertone led the sampling and identification efforts, and he just knows more than anyone now about the types of bugs that live in our houses. Hi, I'm Matt Bertone. I'm an entomologist at North Carolina State University. Matt, uh, we're sitting here in your lab, and it really looks like a lab. I mean, you've got microscopes on benches and tiny jars and uh, forceps. What are they? The, uh, the things are picking up small things. Oh, definitely, yeah. I actually find some of my best subjects around here. Um, we have some, a nice population of uh, southern house spiders, which are pretty freaky to most people, but they're harmless. Now, I understand that you've caused a bit of a stir by going on a reconnaissance of people's homes and finding something like 500 different kinds of bugs in somebody's home. And by the way, can I use the term bug? Is there a difference between a bug and an insect? Well, there definitely is, technically. Uh, so true bugs are a type of insect, but not all insects are bugs. You know, I'm, I'm kind of okay with people calling them all bugs, or I call them critters sometimes, because it's hard to really classify them exactly, but, but we call them arthropods, things with lots of legs, hard exoskeletons. Now, to get to the, the study here, you, you went into people's homes and looked around, and they probably were not happy with what you found. I mean, 500 different kinds of uh, critters on, on average? 579 species was our minimum estimate of how many we found across all of the 50 homes. Each home averaged about 93 species. But the thing we want people to know is that most of these things that we found in homes were accidental wanderers indoors. They came in, maybe hung around for a little bit, and then ended up dying before they had to get out. But there was a good community of arthropods that we know of, that we did find often, that live in homes persistently. These weren't big bugs, were they? I mean, they weren't two feet high at the shoulder. No, no. And that, actually, somebody asked about how much space would all these bugs take up. And uh, I said, you know, when we bring them back, you know, they'd probably take up about a shot glass worth of biomass. I, I made a little uh, collection of some of the critters that we would find in the homes. So here are a few carpet beetle adults. Here's a dark wing fungus gnat. Here's one of the parasitoid wasps. This is actually taken from one of the kitchens in the homes. 
Here's an ant, just to show, but I think everybody knows what ants look like. They're also small. They are very small, and that's kind of what I'm just trying to point out. And uh, you saw the baby silverfish and the very tiny uh, carpet beetle larva. So how do you find them? I mean, you just crawl around the house with a magnifying glass? Not a magnifying glass, but we did crawl around the house. We, yes, yeah, strapped on knee pads. We put on headlamps and had flashlights. Kind of crawled around, looked from ceiling to floor, and just searched every surface that we could find. Here's some cobweb spiders. Those so they're look just familiar. I have those in my garage. Exactly. They're just everywhere. Uh, black widows happen to be a type of cobweb spider as well, but most of them are not dangerous. What, what about the things that live in our beds? You know, the, the mites that your pillow apparently is a, a, a giant occupied zone. I don't know whether that's true, but, you know, that's a little scary. Yeah, so they are there. They're microscopic. And, uh, you know, they're, they're living on the things we shed, like our skin cells and things like that that we shed off our body. All right, that explains what they're feeding on, you know, <laughs> sloughed off skin, I don't know, maybe hair, stuff like that, you know. Is that true for the majority of the things that, are, that we're talking about here, or do they go into the food supply? I mean, do are they in the kitchen kind of thing? So, yes. Yeah, so um, of the things we found, most of them were either predators or scavengers, and then another group, the parasitoids, we found a lot of wasps, little tiny micro wasps that like to parasitize the eggs and other arthropods around. They may be coming in from the outside or maybe parasitizing things indoors. But for the majority, we were looking at mostly we found predators and scavengers. So predators being things like spiders and house centipedes. And then things, scavengers, were things like carpet beetles, book lice, and silverfish. These things eat little bits of crumbs of food or hairs or feathers. Dead insects, these insects that wander in, they die and they become food for a wide variety of arthropods. Uh, we found a lot of Indian meal moths, for instance, in kitchens. And they, they like to eat uh, nuts and bird seed and things like that. So they do kind of become a nuisance sometimes because they happen to like the things we like to eat too. Okay, so it sounds like some of them are there because we've done the shopping, but others are there because the others are there, if you will. That they're, they're, they're feeding off one another. They've set up a kind of, kind of a community. It sounds like they ought to pay part of the mortgage. <laughs> yeah, or maybe we should pay them, I mean, for some of the pest control services. Here's a, another carpet beetle larva. This is the typical one that we would see. He's in... putting it under a microscope here. That's, that's really great. I mean, you can, it really looks like a creature when you look at it under oh, the microscope. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're very cute looking, I think. So carpet beetle larvae are very hairy. They're like a little kind of pipe cleaner. And they go around eating uh, just various things. I, you know, you can collect an insect, and just a regular size insect, and within its thorax, you'll have a very happy, fat carpet beetle larva that's chewed its hole into there and is sitting in there kind of, you know, like a f famous scene in a little tiny room kind of thing. And uh, they're very happy to just do that. And they can live for very long periods of time on very low nutrients. And so they're very well adapted to living in homes. Now, you, you, these carpet beetles, you've mentioned them a couple times. Yeah. Uh, you know, carpet is composed of, I don't know, unless it's synthetic, it's made out of some fur or hair or something like that, which I, I can't imagine eating that. Oh, well, they love it. I mean, so they, unfortunately for them today, most of our carpet is synthetic. And so they can't feed on that. But back in the day, and if you own a wool rug, they really love wool and hairs. And so they'll eat keratin. So like I said, in the, I even wrote in the paper, I observed them feeding on uh, nail clippings and uh, feathers from a household bird and things like that. Not actually on the bird still, but, but you know, on the floor uh, around the cage. So, so they, they like to eat the things. They've kind of uh, gone in this niche where they feed on things that a lot of other creatures don't. It's sort of a good thing that we have all these things, right? Otherwise, you'd have to clean all this stuff up. Yeah, insects and other arthropods are really great decomposers. You know, I got to wonder, if I were, you know, Abe Lincoln uh, in his childhood living in a log cabin, I might not be surprised to find that there were a lot of bugs indoors. But, you know, today's homes are fairly well sealed, and, you know, you do that for all sorts of reasons. And it's still surprising me. I mean, do we have more bugs now than we would have had, say, 150 years ago in our homes? So I'm not sure, and uh, we, we do have archaeological data from some very old homes and, and very old uh, kind of structures. We do think of our modern homes as being completely sterile, I think, and uh, we think of this invisible force field that, you know, that's the outside, this is the inside. We were surprised, and I think the homeowners were surprised to see so many specimens there. Again, a lot of them kind of wandered inside, so that just goes to show that our homes aren't impermeable. And the fact that some of them were alive and doing some interesting things while they were in there is, it, it, I think it's cool to have a nice ecosystem around. 
we may, you know, if you live in a very open house, and actually we're taking this study worldwide, and we've looked at even some homes in the Peruvian jungle and places like that to see if there's differences, and I'm just now identifying some of those critters. <laughs> well, okay, so, I mean, if I'm listening to this, you know, I might be horrified, and so, you know, I'm going to call up the fumigator. Is, is that the right move? I, I, you're an entomologist, so you may be biased, but <laughs> I just sort of wonder, is this anything to worry about? I, I mean, I'm definitely biased, obviously, but... Uh, the fact that you don't notice them just goes to show that you really don't interact with them, that they're mostly small, cryptic things that are very you know, secretive. And so really you shouldn't go about changing behavior in any way. I don't think, I think that using chemicals liberally is probably not the answer to things that aren't really bothering you. Matt Bertone, thanks so very much for uh, talking to me. Yeah, no problem. This is great. Thank you. Matt Bertone is an entomologist at North Carolina State University. So it sounds as though we're surrounded by tiny arthropods and other bugs, and that's okay. If you don't mind, they don't mind. Yeah, but before you get all backpack and raisin on us with your desire to commune with domesticated nature, whether it's the eight-legged critter living in the pores in your nose or the shelled creature grazing on your carpet, we've got to point out that not all bugs are of the type you may want to socialize with. Bed bugs are pretty annoying because they only feed on human blood and they're resistant to most types of pesticides used, so they're very hard to control. It comes out at night and it wants to suck your blood, but it's not a vampire, it's a bed bug. And at least vampires have the decency to shrink from garlic or daylight or whatever. Bed bugs have an almost unworldly desire to stick around. They love mattresses and cushions and also traveling, hitching rides on our clothing and our luggage. That is, when they're not busy gnawing at vulnerable body parts. And now, oh joy, they are developing a resistance to pesticides. I have to tell you, I've been there. You've, I, I, you've developed a resistance to pesticides? <laughs> well, no, I still buy them. No, that isn't it. I've been the gnaw e, if you will. Uh, that happened one night in a hotel in New York City. Oh, the recipient of a gnaw. Yes, I, I got a gnaw, I, I, and they didn't even knock. I mean, it was just, you know, I woke up the next day, and I was itching around my ankles and uh, bed bugs. Did you feel it at the time? No, I didn't. No, it was only later. Actually, it was after I checked out of the hotel, luckily for the hotel management. Did you tell them about the bed bugs? Nope. I was long gone and, you know, kind of lost interest a week later. <laughs> well, new research might give you an itch to return to that hotel, Seth, but not leave with an itch. Insect molecular biologist Joshua Benoit from the University of Cincinnati is a member of a team of 80 scientists that sequenced the genome of the bed bug. The project is part of an initiative called I5K, and the goal? To sequence a thousand different insect genomes. The bed bug DNA provides insight into basic bed bug biology and why they are so hard to eradicate, and this might help us fight back. Well, that sounds like good news to me, but I have to say, if it's all the same, I'm going to stay here in bed bug free California. Oh, I'm willing to bet you have bed bugs in California. You just probably haven't seen them yet. Um, they actually have a worldwide distribution and their conditions are the conditions within your house. If I were to encounter bed bugs, for example, in my bed, uh, what would happen to me? I mean, do I develop a rash? Do I get itchy red spots? I mean, how do I know I've got these guys? So the first thing that a lot of times happens, you might not have any reaction initially, so you wouldn't even notice it, but then after they bite you more and more, you begin to start developing a reaction to their bites and you'll end up with having small red dots and a lot of times you'll see them along the edge of a sheet. And so you'll end up with a lot of bites. You can't really explain them. And then along with that, you'll actually see a lot of bed bug exuviae and bed bug feces, which are these little black dots about the size of a lowercase o all over your bed and around the edges where their bed bugs will be found. Okay, well, we'll get to how we might control this pest, which apparently is very tough to kill. But first, something about its daily, or maybe I should say nightly habits. One of the things you found or didn't find in the genome is that this critter is pretty specialized in that it has very few genes devoted to smell or to sight, which suggests that these bugs have other ways of finding their way to our beds. Yeah, so what we found is that they're really focused on finding a vertebrate host, which is you or I. They have low number of vision genes, which allows them to very uh, easily target finding a vertebrate host in a dark environment because they want to feed during the nighttime, they want to feed on you when you're sleeping, but they need to find you in order to be able to feed on your blood. 
a little bit of the CO2, a lot of the heat of your body, and then some of the chemicals present on your skin seem to all have a combined effect of luring the bed bugs to you. Bed bugs are called ectoparasitic, which I believe means it lives on its host or on its host's blood, I suppose. But does it give anything back? I mean, what did a bed bug ever do for me? Nothing. They absolutely have done nothing at all for anybody. Uh, they're one of those few pests that don't really seem to have any great benefit to any other organisms besides maybe it's one symbiotic bacteria that it carries around. So, but other than that, it doesn't seem to be really a very beneficial insect. Maybe you can tell me something about their engineering, if you will, since you've sequenced the genome there, maybe you know more about that. It is obviously very successful and they can feed multiple times, for example, on somebody who's, you know, asleep there. That happened to me in a hotel in New York, I gotta tell you. Can you say what their genes code for that make them so efficient night feeders? Yeah, so uh, part of the project are focused on looking at the genes associated with blood feeding. And these are really ones that are present and associated with the salivary glands and generation of the saliva. And so their saliva seems to be very specialized and it has a lot of expansion of specific genes that kind of allow them to feed much more effectively. And so this is probably a reason they're able to feed multiple times on the same host. And so this allows them to continually feed on them without the host beginning to develop a very robust immune response. So they're taking bites out of you and, and you don't even, you just sleep right through it. Yep. It also has genes that uh, result in a very tough outer shell. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes that so tough? Is it some sort of like, you know, fingernails or what, what is it? Well, it's all these genes called cuticular proteins. Along with uh, the cuticular proteins and then some lipids, this composes the ectoskeleton of most insects. And so we annotate all these mainly in respect to pests are resistant, but to get an overall idea of what composes the outer layer of bed bugs. That hard outer shell, uh, does that play an important role in terms of eradicating these guys? I mean, they are hard to eradicate. Does that give them a better defense against pesticides? A little bit. So what they've noticed in some of the pesticide resistant populations that you'll see changes in the expression of specific cuticular proteins. And what these seem to do is they correlate with pesticide resistance. And so by expressing more of these, it either is preventing the pesticide from as effectively penetrating into the bed bug or could be detoxifying it somehow. And so this is a big factor in their increased resistance to all the different pesticides and insecticides that are used. Well, speaking of their outer shells, apparently they also have genes that make a protein called Reslin, which I understand protects female bugs from rough sex from aggressive males. Maybe you could describe that. Yeah, so bed bugs, they mate by a process called traumatic insemination. And it's slightly hard to describe, but it involves a male mounting the female, and then it takes a specific organ called a paramere and kind of pierces into the abdomen, not where most insects normally mate, into a special structure called an ectospermalage. And then they deposit the sperm there. It's different than most other insects. And so we actually found a expansion of genes that might be involved in kind of making that ectospermalage more pliable. So um, it would be equivalent of if you've ever seen the doctor actually take a needle and inject into one of the vials with the rubber, and then they can pull it back out and it stays sealed. So we think that this may be involved in that process, but we'll need to actually do some additional studies to fully validate this. What's the advantage to the bugs in having this kind of traumatic sex? It probably benefits the male in some way a lot more than it did the female. And then the female likely developed this organ, this specialized organ on her abdomen called the ectospermalage in order to actually allow this process to occur and damage her the least. So it, it seems to be probably a process where males were competing to mate better, but it's not very beneficial to the female. It's my understanding, Joshua, that bed bugs once had wings, but they apparently have lost them uh, once they figured out how to hitch a ride on us, I suppose. Could you see the genes for wings in the genome, you know, the, even though the wings aren't there anymore? There's a few type of genes associated uh, with the development of wings. So bed bugs will still have smaller wing pad areas where they li most likely had wings before. And they still seem to have most of these genes that are associated with the development of wings. I've heard it said that the bed bug is a living fossil. 
but except for losing its wings, has it changed much over its history? I mean, uh, would the bed bugs of 100,000 years ago look pretty much the same? Yeah, they would look pretty much the same. They haven't really changed a lot in a long time. But why wouldn't it change? I mean, what conditions allow a bug, or for that matter, any animal, to stay virtually the same? I mean, is it just found an ecological niche that's never challenged, and it's earning a good living biting people at night, and it doesn't need to change? Yeah, it's likely the pressures of it. It's Once it developed to be a very good ectoparasite of humans and other vertebrates, once it had that body style and looked that way, it was effectively living that way. It probably hasn't needed to change that much since that time, but as we've recently seen, the high levels of increase of pesticide resistance is one of those sort of changes that are occurring, but isn't as overt as one of the ones like if it grew wings or if some other process happened. So in some sense, we may be responsible for the bed bugs having to change their act. A little bit, yes. Yeah. Well, finally, Joshua, there are some bugs that are harmless. There are some bugs that are even beneficial. The bed bug doesn't seem to be either one. So let's say we find a way to get rid of it for good. Could there be an unforeseen downside to ridding the world of this species? So for a lot of insects, so such as mosquitoes and other ones, there might be an ecological impact of eliminating them. But I don't foresee very many impacts of getting rid of bed bugs. They seem to only be a ectoparasite. And so I'm thinking that getting rid of them won't have the large ecological impact, but who knows, it may be doing something very special that we have not discovered yet. It might have some large impact on your career, might it not? I mean, if yes. you got rid of them? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you're not going to fight it just because of that. No, if, if I could get rid of them and get rid of bed bugs, I'd just move on to working on some other blood feeding insect. <laughs> Joshua Benoit, thank you so very much for speaking with us today. Thank you. I appreciate the time to talk about bed bugs. Joshua Benoit is an insect molecular biologist at the University of Cincinnati. Coming up, the sight of a piece of rotting meat might prompt you to throw it away, but our hunter-gatherer ancestors would probably dine on it and on the microbes that made it rot in the first place. Next, sorting out our buggy friends from foes with all our mites on Big Picture Science. a lot in the show about the human relationship with bugs and oh hey Gary what's up hey guys we're just getting started with the recording here yeah well some other guy was in here earlier using the mic and I don't know who he was and who knows what kind of germs he had and since we all have to use this mic I figured I'd swab it down a little first <laughs> Gary I really don't think that's why, necessary why are you doing this? Uh, the guy was kind of a spitter Ooh, yeah. oh oh yeah. was a spitter I, I, I don't think I want to get close to this windscreen go for it Gary okay <laughs> Okay, do you think that's clean? Yours too, Molly. What? <laughs> okay. Wow, thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thanks. So we'll, we'll just... Uh... Oh, one more thing. Open up. What? what? <laughs> a little Lysol. Molly? You've got to be kidding. Okay, I'll just leave the bottle here for you. Uh, I'll see you, Gary. Thanks. All right, carry on. <laughs> Is he gone? God, this stuff tastes awful. I can't even feel my mouth. That's because he sprayed Lysol into your mouth. Yeah, don't remind me. Where where were we? Uh, oh, it's gotten uh, into Gary. Yeah, I don't. He's, he's gone on this sterilization kick. If that's really sterilization, well, no. we, yeah. we, we we were talking about our relationship with bugs. I guess. <laughs> well, there are no bugs in my mouth now, for sure. Okay, from the top, we're hearing a lot about the human relationship with bugs, and mostly from the scientists who study bugs. So now let's look at it from another perspective, from a scientist who studies humans. I'm Tom McDade. I'm a biological anthropologist at Northwestern University. Humans have had an evolutionary history with bugs and microbes that predate antibacterial soap and fumigation, but also vaccines and antibiotics. Some microbes are harmful and even deadly, and progress in science and technology has helped save lives. But in the developed world, at least, our obsession with doing away with all bugs 
our preoccupation with sterilization is ridding our bodies of and also limiting our exposure to beneficial microbes that help us digest food and even prevent diseases such as cancer. Okay, Tom, whatever bugs are on us or around us right now, it's a fact that we have a history together. So how far back does our relationship with bugs and microbes really go? Since the beginning, we came from bugs and microbes. They are part of our world. They are on our bodies, in our bodies, in our homes, everywhere, around everywhere we live. And they always have been and probably always will be. And if they're not, then we're in big trouble because they do a lot of good things for us. They play key roles in our physiology and our metabolism. They protect us against more pernicious microbes that, that do us harm, infectious diseases. They play critical roles in the development of our immune systems and prevent uh, a lot of diseases like autoimmune diseases and even cardiovascular diseases and allergies and asthma. So they play pretty critical roles for us. Well, look, if we could go back 100,000 years to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, what kind of buggy biome would they have had? Would it have been pretty much the same as what we have today, or would it have been substantially different? Well, sir, sure, it depends on your point of reference. So for you and me and other folks uh, probably listening to this show, living in relatively hygienic, sanitized, affluent, urbanized environments, um, the microbiological world is radically different in many ways. Um, our evolutionary ancestors lived very closely with the dirt and the organisms that live in dirt. They ate roots and vegetables and fruits that were not bleached or um, sanitized. They drank water that was not bleached or irradiated. Um, they ate meat sometimes that was rotting and, and full of microbes that were doing some good work in terms of digesting that meat and making it easier to, for them to digest. Um, so they lived in a much richer microbial world. Okay, so they were closer to nature in some sense. You look specifically at the role of microbes in human health. Maybe you could just give me some idea of what kind of bugs help keep us healthy. You've already said that many of them are beneficial. Maybe a specific example of a critical role that such things might play. Sure. So probably the best evidence for direct critical roles that these kinds of microbes play in our health is, is with respect to the development of our immune system. There are microbes out there that try to turn us into copies of them and they do harm and they cause a lot of suffering and disease and the vast majority of microbes do not and in fact often do good things for us. Whoa, but, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You say turn us into copies of them. You, you got to be more specific. I, I, I don't <laughs> look like a paramecium, at least I didn't this morning. No, you didn't, but there are viruses, the influenza virus, for example, that wants to infect your cells and hijack its cellular machinery to make copies of itself to infect other cells in your body and then infect other people when you sneeze on them. So we want to avoid that. And our immune system is, for the most part, very effective at identifying and distinguishing friend um, from foe. But the immune system is actually a two-edged sword. Uh, a lot of what it does to prevent infections from getting out of control can cause collateral damage to cells in our own bodies. And when these processes become poorly regulated and, and out of control, then then the um, treatment can be the worst can be worse than the disease in some cases with respect to our body's uh, responses, and exposure to microbes in the natural world are an important part of training up our immune system to learn how to regulate itself. And this is where we become a bit out of balance by depriving our immune systems of the diversity and intensity of exposure that was more common in our evolutionary history. We used to live with bugs, didn't even know about it, didn't think about it much. Today, we seem to be fixed upon getting rid of them. We're obsessed with sanitation and hygiene. Uh, how, how preoccupied are we really? Is this just hype? Are, are people really trying to be too clean? <laughs> yes, well, uh, even in the United States, infectious diseases are the number one killers of, of infants and children. And globally, of course, that is, um, has been the case for a long time and still is. So we need to pay attention to influenza, measles, polio, things that, that can kill us. But the vast majority of microbes are harmless and, in fact, do a lot of good. So the, the trick is to identify strategies that specifically target the bugs that do bad things to us and do what we can to prevent exposure and uh, reduce conflict consequences of infection, um, but not get rid of the things that do good things for us, like 
facilitate the development of our immune system. And if we don't do that, we put ourselves at, at much greater risk of autoimmune diseases, of some cancers, of allergies and asthma, because these kinds of non-infectious microbial exposures, particularly early in life, are really critical for helping the immune system establish its regulatory um, functions. Well, it seems that if you pick up just about any magazine dealing with these subjects, uh, they'll, they'll just tell you to make sure you eat more dirt as a kid and then you'll be okay. I mean, it, it's I guess it's okay to say we've got to be, you know, discriminating in which bugs we avoid and which bugs we encourage. But of course, most people don't know which those are and they wouldn't be able to identify them anyhow. Yeah, so it, this is tricky. You know, I tell you what we do in my house. I have two young kids, and uh, the three-second rule is more like a three-minute rule. We don't fuss when kids pick up stuff off the floor. We don't worry when they go out and play in the dirt and get get dirt in their face and in their mouths. We buy farmer's market vegetables, and we don't worry about sanitizing them. We just sort of wash them off and, and let the kids have at it. But, you know, so you can do those kinds of things, but we are in a qualitatively different microbial world here in the United States in this historical moment than our ancestors were. So we're going to have to think more creatively about perhaps supplementation strategies or, or travel early in life to get exposures to these kinds of microbes. Is this just a matter of education or is there some sort of techno fix that will allow us to <laughs> eschew the bad ones and embrace the good ones? Well, let's hope so. I think there can be a return to a little bit more common sense approach. We don't need to sanitize all our surfaces, uh, uh, especially for our, our kids. The vast majority of the microbes in your home are, are harmless, and in fact, many are, are beneficial in the sense that they crowd out the really bad ones and that they may do some good things for your metabolism and training up your immune system. But ultimately, I think we've sort of uh, uh, we've gone too far in our affluent Western lifestyles that we have with sanitized food and water supplies which are, again, great things in terms of reducing burdens of mortality and morbidity from infectious disease, but run the risk of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So we could look to vaccination as a potential way forward. This is a way to provide a, a dose of something dangerous that's, that's delivered at a, at a dose that's not dangerous and actually boosts immunity. It, it makes changes in your body and your immune system in such a way that protects you against that disease. We could think of some strategies along those lines by providing manageable doses of safe microbiota that have these immunoregulatory and pro-metabolic um, effects on our health without the downstream health consequences. You know, uh, most people don't seem to like bugs, at least, you know, the conventional definition of bugs. And I'm kind of wondering why that is and whether, there, whether there's some evolutionary reason for that or whether it's just that macro photography has shown us just how weird looking many of these creatures are. Are we simply repelled by these bugs, ugly mugs? Hmm. That could be. They're not a lot of really pretty bugs. But in our, in our evolutionary past, part of our history was the consumption of bugs. A lot of them are really rich sources of protein and fat and, uh, and calcium. And so they were an important part of our Paleolithic diet. So I suspect that our evolutionary ancestors were not quite as repulsed. But then again, they didn't have to confront the close-up picture of a bed bug. <laughs> yeah, there is that. <laughs> well, finally, Tom. There is a proposal, as you know, for wiping out the mosquito using genetic engineering technology. Let's say we could do that, that we could rid ourselves of an annoying insect, but also control the spread of some pretty awful viruses, Zika, dengue fever, malaria, and so forth. Considering the role that microbes have played in human evolution, what might be the downside to ridding ourselves for good of one of these dangerous pests? Well, there's no question that those vector-borne, mosquito-borne diseases that you list are, are tremendous sources of suffering and, and mortality all around the world. So I think there's a strong case to be made for targeting that vector in particular. But we have to be wary of unforeseen consequences, particularly if we muck around in the genetic uh, machinery and code that, that these species pass on to future generations and then perhaps may pass on to related species. So we have to be wary of the unforeseen consequences there. We don't want to generate a super bug, for example, that, that would be resistant to future eradication efforts. Tom McDade, thanks so very much for allowing me to uh, kind of bug you today. <laughs> You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Tom McDade is a biological anthropologist at Northwestern University. 
well, we've learned a lot of things in this show about these small little critters that, uh, you know, aren't all that appealing. But I figure that dates back to the invention of the microscope when we could finally, you know, develop the germ theory. And small things suddenly became dangerous in our mind. And that includes these small insects. But you know what? You can try and separate yourself from the yuck and the muck, but these guys are part of our history. And we're learning that both at the macroscopic level and even at the DNA level, the genetic level. And then we have to make tough choices about which microbes to be friends with and which ones maybe to try to scrub out of our lives. Yeah, and it's kind of tough because how do I tell the good guys from the bad guys? They don't wear hats. Thanks to the larger-than-life talent that is always with us and helps us produce this show, Gary Niederhoff, Barbara Vance, and our intern, Aaron Ross. Also, thanks to financial support from Reno Sholsky David and Sammy David. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to With All Our Mites. And if you crave more Big Picture Science, if you're itching for more, you'll find it in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because, after all, your face mites can't hear the show if you're listening with earbuds, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review of the show. And if you have other comments, criticisms, or suggestions, well, throw in some faint praise and email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Who has more gunk on their face, well, Seth it, or me? It looks like you both have similar amounts of gunk, but I'm hoping that <laughs> Seth has got a lot more mites. I just have a feeling about well, it. Well, well, <laughs> what, what is, is, is it some comment on my lifestyle? <laughs>